Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the latest installment of uh, Building the Scottish State with myself, Dr. Mark McNaught, on the 21st of October, 2021. And I have the pleasure of having my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, David Henry, uh, who I've been working with for several months for the Scottish Sovereignty Research Group. And so, uh, first of all, David, thank you for being with us this evening. Thanks, I'm not gonna press that button again. <laughs> I lost okay. 25 minutes of my life. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, I, I thought I, th I thought it'd be good to start out as just kind of talking about what we've been doing with the Scottish Sovereignty Research Group, and in particular the recent letter that we sent to the MSPs and MPs. And so basically, we've been working mm -hmm. together with uh, seven or eight other people since uh, January. Uh, January or so of this year, we've been having weekly meetings. Uh, and it, at first, it was just a bunch of guys, mostly guys, with some exceptions, getting together and uh, talking about how uh, independence could get it be achieved. And uh, then we formally, you know, uh, got our name, uh, established our name, the Sovereign the Scottish Sovereignty Research Group, and we've become uh, we've we've been working with both members of the ALBA party and with the SNP. So, uh, what's been your perspective on the progress that we've made over the past uh, several months? Well, I think when we look where we came from, because we originally uh, started out, if you remember, as the people that came up with the manifesto for Indy. Yeah, and that, that was back in, we published that back in February. Uh, and that's, first of all, I think, got us on the right track. Um, I think I think people are beginning to now realise there is there is certainly more than one way that you can deliver a, a, a Scotland's future. And uh, there's very few examples, according to all our experts in our group, that use a referendum to deliver independence because that's fraught with certain dangers. So I think people are starting to listen both in the SNP, certainly in ALBA, and other smaller parties like ISP. Um, I think I'd like to see us get connections with the Green Party. I don't have anybody that I know in the Green Party. So I'm hoping that one of our group, part of our group does, so that we can um, ensure that we're completely inclusive of all the indie supporting parties. So that's where I think we are. I think it's quite positive that, mm -hmm. that we're getting um lots of interest uh, obviously as you know we published in time for the alba conference we published the treaty of union document mm -hmm. that's going down uh, really well uh, we still have plenty available if you want to buy one out there <laughs> make a great christmas gift that's the information <laughs> <laughs> you think i'm kidding this is what it looks like in a frame you know that's, that's the center pages yeah. um but it's really sparked, I think that was very helpful. It's really sparked people's imagination so that they are now starting to question, first of all, uh, how do we know Scotland's uh, people are sovereign, the Scottish nation, et cetera, um, which of course came out of our meetings, as you know. Um, and uh, it's, I think, I think what we've managed to do, where I haven't seen any other groups really do yet, is because there's so many uh, people involved uh, bringing our policies uh, and publishing them. It's not one person's view. It's it's mm -hmm. it's a collective view, and I think that's really helpful. Probably why that. we're being taken seriously. Um, and uh, I think our job going forward is to branch out and uh, meet and discuss um, with all the yes groups in particular, but also the political parties. Um, because we've got a lot of work to do. And when people start to uh, realize there are other routes that Scotland can use um, and they are legal and that's what the experts are all telling us. And here's the roadmap. Here's the plan. Um, it spot, starts to spark because there's uh, interest and discussion, which is a, a healthy thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Because we recently sent a letter to the all of the uh, well the MSPs and the MPs that are of uh, pro independence parties, uh, basically saying that um, look, uh, you, you know, Scots are sovereign, uh, and the and the emphasis on a Section Thirty order is um, you know fraught with peril, in in not not least because the well a getting a, a, a legal. Section 30 order from Boris Johnson is pretty much barking up the wrong tree, to say it lightly. And also, even if that one was 
uh, granted, there's some big difficulties with the franchise and with the, and the and with the functioning of a referendum if it was done similar to what it was in 2014, because uh, they, they're using the local franchise. And in most of, at least in, for example, here in, in France, uh, 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 you know, French citizens can vote in um, in the national and um, and uh, parliamentary elections. Uh, but but I, when I was a UK, well, when when I was a uh, you know when I was when it was part of the EU, I could vote in the local and the European elections. But I couldn't vote on constitutional issues regarding uh, regarding you know, the French government, and I think that that needs to be extended to the French, sorry, to the excuse me, to the uh, Scottish franchise in whatever kind of confirmatory vote that may come about. But that the, you know that you know actual Scots, rather than people who have uh, you know immigrated there very recently or people who have second homes, this type of thing. And I think the franchise needs to be clarified for whatever you know, elections and referendums come in the future. No, and, and that's obviously, as you know, there's been um, some discussion within our group about the franchise, and I've seen it discussed elsewhere uh, more broadly. Um, I was uh, coming back from a, a, uh, the Edinburgh branch of Alba last night, their first AGM meeting, and we were discussing it in the car, and uh, my thoughts on this are we have to... Uh, not only is the future of delivering Scotland's future got to be a democratic process that is um, accepted by the international community, but it must include all sections of society on a fair basis. And I think we should be focusing on best practice so that there's other countries that have gone through this process. What is the best practice? That is what we should be using as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you remember, Mark, back in when we were discussing, I think it was probably December last year. So it's been a, nearly a whole year round yeah. when we were discussing the manifesto. I'm the one in the group that questioned um, all these recent legal uh, rulings and wondering why people were still talking about the Scotland Act. Because the Scotland Act is a Westminster piece of legislation. Yeah. That behind us, that there, that's the treaty. That's the original treaty in 1706, which we've now published. Um, and we didn't spell check it, unlike some other people that did. So you'll find some unusual spellings in there. <laughs> in fact, I think I now realize where my where my spelling comes from. <laughs> 1700s. So I'm not a bad speller at all. I'm just a classical speller, I think. Yeah, there you go. Um, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we deliberately didn't spell check it. And it's not that treaty. And I noticed people reading it last night, watched them, and they, they said, oh, they've seen these articles, one to is it 24, 25, I can't remember, uh, 25 articles. But what you didn't used to see is the first, the preamble, which, of course, confirms that Scotland's an independent country and the Scottish people are sovereign. Um, and now that was confirmed in some rulings recently in uh, the Joanna Cherry case when she took uh, Boris Johnson's government to court. I sat through the appeal on that in the court sessions and took lots of notes. I also um, uh, read the ruling in the Martin Keaton case. That was very interesting. And here's a key point for everyone at home who's watching us. In that ruling, um, there's all, it's the, te the devil is always in the detail. People need to remember that. And in that ruling, um, the judge said, although the parliament was reconvened under an act from Westminster, that the, uh, it is the, the Scottish people were sovereign. It is the people that decide who are voting for that institution and in those elections decide what powers it's got, not the people that invented it. So that's the Scottish people that can decide what powers the Scottish parliament has. It has no, doesn't need to refer to Westminster or to any Conservative MPs in London, which of course they outnumber us. It's got nothing to do with them. They can say whatever they like. It is purely a matter for the sovereign nation, i.e. The, the Scottish nation. So there's no doubt whatsoever, the power lies with people in Scotland. You don't need to ask for permission. You don't need to wait for somebody else to give you a date, but you do need to do it in a democratic process that's fair and that the international community will accept, which is what we've exactly 
proposed. And mm -hmm. obviously you're right, we've written to the MPs. We haven't written to the MSPs yet, but that's coming, I think. Actually, I, actually I did. I sent that to the MSPs as well. Oh, you uh, sent it to them as well. I, I did. I did. From no, them. I know. All we, got, we, we only got one, uh, you know, it was responsible, <laughs> so. Oh, well, we'll just have, and, and, and I think this, this, this is it. Uh, I think there's a, a combination of things going on here. I think um, some of our politicians don't actually understand the history and they don't understand that the people are sovereign. And they, if you like, just accepted that, oh, well, um, uh, the Electoral Commission and David Cameron agreed to a referendum. So that's how it works. In fact, that's not how it works. And they really do need to brush up their history a bit, which is what we're helping people understand is their mm -hmm. history. And because, I mean, I was going to say, do you remember the amount of discussion we had on what would be our, um, our not the logo, but our, our sort of statement, our, our strap line for the, for the group, apart from the yeah. long time it took to get a, a, a logo. <laughs> yeah. Many, many weeks and lots of discussions and what color will we use and what do we want it to say? But if you remember, and I think this is what's really interesting for people, we came up in the end with a very simple three words, empowering the nation. Mm -hmm. And we're empowering the nation through information. So as people realize that they're sovereign and it's up to them, they also have to start thinking about what sort of country do you want to have? Um, there's no point becoming independent if you just repeat everything that Westminster does. That, that would be a complete waste of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see some questions coming. I, I'd like to answer that one if you don't mind. Well, did, go ahead, go ahead, please. Yeah, did Brexit breach the Treaty of Union? Yes, absolutely it did. In fact, it's the most recent glaring uh, um, breach of the treaty because the Scottish people in that referendum for the EU in 2016, 62% voted remain. Now, just because our neighbour south of the border majority voted to leave, that doesn't mean we have to leave. And therefore, and English laws are not allowed, um, are not allowed to overrule uh, laws in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are, Scotland was part of the EU thanks to its part of the union. The other partly of the union england decided to leave and we just have to do whatever they do well no you don't so that straight away breaks um uh the treaty of union scotland's a sovereign nation it's up to the people in scotland to decide if they wanted to leave the eu the majority that took part in that vote said that they wanted to remain so uh, hopefully that's answered uh <laughs> answered your question yes it did indeed break it um, now, what do we do about that? I think that's just as important. So first of all, our group, and uh, I know that a number of yes groups have contacted us and they want, they are asking us to come and make, do presentations around the country to explain um, not only the roadmap that we have published and sent to the MPs and MSPs, uh, that document is on our website. The people at home can download it. You just visit the, there you go, fantastic, Scottish Sovereignty Research Group org, and it's in the document library. So it's down I, I think they may have to register, uh, which, which, of course, we want them to do. But uh, oh, it, yes. you, you, mean... just, you just register. You can use your Facebook profile, et cetera, to register, and you're able to then just download that. There's a few other interesting documents there as well. And in the future, there will be a video library with short videos um, on different subjects. Um, so, uh, and of course, we're um, more than happy for our members of our team to go and present and discuss and answer questions. So by all means, please visit the website um, and you can download the document yourself. It's quite a detailed document. I mean, the, the road plan, <laughs> this idea, do you want Scotland to be independent? Yes or no? Well, <laughs> nothing in life is that simple. Um, and therefore, uh, I think people need to actually spend a bit of time looking at what are the options? What sort of country do you want? We've laid out as a group um, what we think should happen, and that's gone to the politicians. I did notice that Ian Blackford said that their SMP um, Westminster group is going to meet to 
what was it, refocus on independence? Yeah, and I've, I've actually sent some messages to him uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, emphasize, and he, he's got our documents. I'll, I'll put it that way. He's, he's, he's got our documents. He knows what, you know, what, what, we, what we're proposing. So and I, I, yeah. I asked him to please take that into consideration when he meets up with the other MPs. So yeah. we'll see, we'll I mean, we, we, uh, I'm not going to comment on some of the more cynical uh, views out there, but uh, I do wonder what's been going on in, for seven years. Um, uh, what, what I do like, though, and I actually think this is healthy, we need to take uh, Scotland's future and the future plans and what the country want out of the hands of one political party or even political parties generally. This is about everybody. It's our futures that's going to be affected. So the more people that get involved in these discussions, the better. Um, I mean, I met a woman over at the Hope Over Fear a couple of weeks ago. And I've met mm -hmm. her before, actually. She campaigns for, so I, I've said she contacts me, we'll invite her to one of our weekly meetings. She has a completely different subject that she wanted to be considered. And this is why you need more people involved, because while we think we're dealing fairly, here's something that we've not thought about, which I hadn't thought about. Now, she campaigns for uh, organ transplant. Uh, apparently, she'd had a, a lung transplant herself. And she told me that uh, all those operations are coordinated and are carried out in Newcastle in the north of England. And I said, well, what about if we were independent in the EU? Can people? She goes, no, those type of patients can't fly. They can't go in a plane because they don't have the lung function. Um, they have to travel at ground level. So that means uh, traveling, so let's say, to the EU, um, if we were part of the EU, single market again, uh, would be very problematic because... It's going to be a long journey to get there. Um, so that needs to be taken into, a, into account. And that's something that we haven't, we've not mentioned that. We mm -hmm. have mentioned that we need to have a national assembly, that all sections of society, the politicians as well, the different parties, but different groups, church groups, you name it, should all be involved in that to help uh, plan the future and come up and come up with the recommendations. And I certainly think that's the way to go. Um, and that is exactly the type of subject that I would never have thought about because I've never had experience of it. So clearly we need to have that in place for our, uh, going forward when Scotland declares its independence and starts its future. We need to have an agreement between Scotland and England's health services and all that. And of course, if we're going to be uh, similar to what happens in Ireland, they, uh, the UK and Ireland have a free travel area, which predates the EU and is still in place. So I would expect that Scotland and England and Ireland and Wales will also have a free travel area. Mm -hmm. So that people, and it will be similar to the, so all these things uh, are in there to be discussed. How, what will happen with the border? The border is quite a simple thing. It's not difficult, not unless you leave it to Boris Johnson, of course. Um, but a border could operate very similarly to Switzerland and France, which I've been back and forward many times with goods. Now, if you're just traveling yourself, there's no real issues at all. You, you, there's even buses that go backwards and forwards. Nobody comes on and stops the bus and get, get your passport out. That doesn't happen. Um, however, for goods, goods have to be checked and they have to have uh, a have been uh, either checked or they've been uh, pre-approved and you've got an agent. That'll be similar, I'm afraid. In England's leaving the single market regulation. Scotland uh, wants to be in line with the EU. So we need to have um, our standards, food standards, etc., and product standards in line with the single market. The single market yeah. is our future. Yeah. Uh, England, if it's going to go down this lower standards of food and bringing in imported stuff from the other side of the world, well, that's up to them. However, uh, that our product that we produce here, food and um, drink, etc., and fisheries, is of a higher quality than some of the stuff that they can, they can buy. Yes, cheaper, but what, why are we talking to countries? I mean, I know it says a trade deal announced today, £2.5 billion worth for New Zealand. Would he do yeah. that? I mean, my God, it's so insignificant. And if we believe in climate change, why are we doing trade deals with a country on the other side of the world? Well, yeah, for things like onions and meat and stuff like oh. that. I mean, it's, it's absurd. It's, it's absolutely absurd. And, and yeah. so just imagine how much carbon is being produced to get that to our supermarket shelves. 
Yeah. It makes and, no and sense that, whatsoever. Yeah. And, and that's what uh, uh, brings me on to the next subject is that I saw a, a question coming up regarding whether the, whether the EU would consider the, you know, a, a Scottish accession, you know, uh, independence if it was done through this route, legal and recognized, it, et cetera. Uh, I've, we've been in touch with uh, EFTA uh, and I, I talked to uh, a representative from the secretariat in Brussels. And uh, basically, and, and when I contacted him before, I was asking in the context of if Scotland were to become independent through the uh, basically what we laid out in the manifesto for Indy, whereby there's a big majority, uh, you know, SNP, you know, SNP one, ALBA two, you know, 90 seat plus majority, um, et cetera. Uh, you know, would you consider, you know, uh, what, what would EFTA consider accepting uh, Scotland in? And, and, he, and he's basically said, yeah, if, if you're independent, uh, you know, and, or, or more specifically, if you if Scotland has the power and the competence to negotiate international treaties and the powers to abide by them, they, we, they just send a letter to the EFTA Council. They would welcome Scotland in and they would help the e, they would help Scotland get back, get back into the EEA and the single market. Uh, I called him. I, I, I contacted them again today. And I said because I, I through a colleague, I was going to contact uh, Henri. Uh, Henri Guetaz, who's the who's the Secretary General, and I sent a uh, I sent a voicemail to him, and then within a few minutes, um, uh, you know, uh, Omar uh, uh, Thorfner called me and said, "Oh, and that I talked to you before," and he said, "Well, look, you know, uh, the, the, the same thing stands as what I said a few months ago, but nothing's changed, meaning Scotland hasn't become independent." And so, but as soon as they, you know, but they're they're indifferent. They don't give it. They they don't. They don't care whether it's a Section 30 order or not, and they're not religious on, you know, international acceptance. It, 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 it's simply, according to their articles, Scotland, Scot the Scottish government simply needs to have competence over over international treaties and the powers to abide by them. They don't, you know, and, and they don't really care. Otherwise, they're like, come on in. You know, I mean, it's it's really couldn't be clearer, given my conversation with him today. So. Um, well, but I remember, Mark, if you remember, Mark, we came up with uh, for the Manifesto for Indy one sentence, which is what we asked for political parties to accept. One party accepted everything in our manifesto, which was the ISP. Mm -hmm. um, and Alba, if I remember rightly, uh, appeared to uh, adopt about half of what was in there. Uh, and, and, and for anyone who wasn't aware, and we sent this to the SNP as well. So let's just imagine that um, they had accepted and put this at the top of their manifesto. So if they had accepted this one sentence and it stated the Scottish people assert that the Scottish Parliament is the only Parliament that is empowered to represent the sovereign rights of the Scottish people. If that had been at the top of the SNP and the Greens uh, manifestos, we would be independent now. And, and back in the EEA. And we and would have had our EEA membership, uh, no doubt approved, and we would be busy um, building our institutions and ensuring that our health care is uh, the best it can be and our own tax system and our own central bank would be busily being built up. And now this, and this, we, this is what we try to tell people. If you get out of this uh, mindset of, oh, we need a referendum because that's what we did before and it says in the Scotland Act, you, as soon as you assert that, that statement, the Scottish Parliament becomes the only sovereign parliament to represent us. Therefore, there is no Scotland Act. There is no mm -hmm. Section 30. In fact, all the pieces of paper that Westminster has passed in the last, what, 50 to 100 years uh, become blank. They're, they're blank pieces of paper. They don't exist anymore. And then you've got Scott. And of course, the, what, I, I wonder if your viewers would be interested in knowing what the, what the list of 11 things we've listed. Number one, a national assembly. This is all within a two-year period of asserting your sovereignty. Number two, international recognition, which you know the group's been busy trying to ensure that's already uh, lined up. Number three, membership of EFTA and re-entering the European Economic Area, customs union essential if you want free movement without lots of paperwork and costs, as I know. Uh, free freedom of movement. Uh, within the EEA, etc., so we get that back. Uh, the Commons EU schemes, such as uh, in education, uh, Erasmus, yeah, Erasmus, research programs, um, 
Yep. The e and then here's something, and I've heard, I've seen other people talk about this and touch on it. And isn't it interesting that uh, at the moment we have to on road we have to send all our exports down into England to get to a port in England to try and get it to the EU, along with all the problems that's causing. And of course, we have perfectly good ports here that we could expand. We've got uh, ferry production facilities here that we should be using. We need our direct link to the single market. Um, so EEA and EU Scotland trade links, i.e. the ports at Rosyth and Aberdeen and no doubt some others. Uh, state pensions, uh, the UK is the lowest state pension in the EU. It's a total disaster. It leaves people in poverty. You shouldn't need to have pensioners getting a, uh, an extra £200 winter fuel allowance, so, even though that's going to be wiped out by the new gas price increases. So they're not actually any better off. This is appalling. We, we live in a country that's so-called rich uh, with the city of London generating all this money. Yeah, but they're not paying enough taxes because stuff is hidden offshore. Scotland won't be like that. So state pensions can certainly be increased. Uh, number eight was free movement between Scotland and England for people and a trade deal, which obviously we would hope uh, means that there's, let, there's not that much need for checks, etc., and customs. Uh, build the infrastructure of government. That's an ongoing process, and we certainly need that. The Scottish Constitution, that was number 10. And then finally, towards the end of the two-year, very busy, lots of hard work with everyone involved, there's a confirmatory referendum asking, do you wish Scotland to continue to be an independent country with all these deals in place? Or do you want to go back into a union with England? I'm pretty certain the vast majority of people will realise we're much better off and we should continue as an independent country within the European family with a trade deal with, with England. Um, that's, the te that's the 10, 11 steps that's been sent to all the politicians. It's up to them. And now it's up to people at home to tell their politicians what they want. Because um, at the end of the day, they're there to represent you. Um, they're not there for their own careers. They're there to represent you. So I think we've done a great job at, at getting people round a table. I mean, what I like about our SSRG is we've got four professors. We've got yourself, obviously, who's obviously on the run uh, from the UK, so that you're hiding over in France <laughs> with all that with all that horrible wine and cheese that they've got. Oh, it's um, just awful. It's just awful. <laughs> And we've got, we've got, what was it, Paul McCartney, another Paul McCartney. There's far too many Paul McCartneys, actually, um, uh, over in the States. Uh, also yeah, in, 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 at, at Towson University in, in, in Baltimore, yeah. Baltimore. I wondered whereabouts he was. But you know what's interesting when you hear him ask questions is, of course, he's outside our sphere, outside our bubble. Um, and he asks a question or comes up with a point, which is much more from an international perspective, looking in rather than us looking out and that i think i think in in a way that encapsulates what's wrong down in westminster with even our mps even the more enlightened ones they're trapped and working within the system it's very difficult for them to get a broad view so i think what we've done with the ssrg uh is great and long may it continue we need to get the yes groups together we need them to all understand what their rights are what what powers they actually have. Um, and, and then we start the work because we're going to need everybody's input. As I say, for that woman to come and tell me about transparent issues and that we'd have to have a deal because they all get done through Newcastle, apparently. Um, and so there's obviously uh, trade uh, and communication within the two uh, health services from Scotland. So there'll be donors that are donate, donate in Scotland that they're then uh, the organs are used in England. But the main place for it apparently is in Newcastle, which I was unaware that that's where it was all done. Um, but that's just one thing that will be out of hundreds of things that we'll have to have answers for and have, so, have something in place. So we need everyone's input. Um, and that way we hopefully get all the right answers. Yeah.
No, exactly. Yeah, and and so I mean, what would be an ideal scenario? Uh, I mean, my ideal scenario would be within. I mean, absolutely optimally that like the both the SNPs, uh, the, sorry, the MSPs and the MPs embrace our strategy within the next couple of weeks. The uh, the 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 MPs uh, vote. Uh, the Scottish MPs vote collectively to withdraw from the union. Uh, and dissolve the Treaty of Union. The MSPs vote, to, you know, the pro-independence S Green and SNP MSPs vote to uh, affirm the Scottish Parliament as the um, as the uh, uh, as the supreme, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, retainer of the sovereignty of the Scottish people. Uh, then, then we send a letter to uh, they send a letter to EFTA. And we can help draft, uh, and then Scotland is back in the in the in, in, in Scotland is in EFTA and back in the EEA by Christmas. That would be beautiful. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, yeah. that way, but uh, I, I think that's unlikely timescale. Um, yeah, I, I do. I do think. Uh, I think there's a process before this, which we're now in. Whether we'll, whether people like it or not, we're now in. We're asking the awkward questions, and we're getting answers. Um, so you've got the currency group who have done lots of work on a Scottish currency and a reserve bank, and of course that is of course the way to go. Um, and uh, that's that 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 work continues. And um, the good thing with us, I think, is we're not proposing, we're not claiming to have all the answers. No. We're just asking the awkward questions and finding people that do have the answers. Yeah. Um, so what I think will happen, and what's likely to happen, uh, I noticed Alba, and I only noticed it the other day. If you remember at the weekend at our meeting, I said we should try and help pull together a, some form of conference, you know, for and have international guests there and civic leaders, etc., to help with the policy to, to keep this all moving. Um, and it turns out that the Alba party, the first thing they announced, which I, I wasn't in that room at the time, so I didn't know, um, they want to have one after the next council election. They want to mm -hmm. see a, a basically a citizens conference about constitution. Um, and our, that's our that, so I think that's our next step. Our next step is to try and help that happen. Yeah. Uh, I don't think uh, it should be a political party that drives that because then you end up with tribal politics and other parties don't want to be part of it because it was their idea. And that's why I think uh, our group is going to be central. That we pull all the parties together, we bring in the international guests, and, and we help this constitutional convention or conference, whatever you want to call it, to actually set us on the right road. And so I think that's going to be next spring mm -hmm. before that happens, which gives us time to convince people. Sure. And when is the, when is the, when are the council elections? They're May. So I'm, I can't remember okay. the exact date. So it's usually the first week of May. So um, I, I noticed someone saying, what was it? Uh, already a very comprehensive constitution has gotten drafted. Indeed, there's, there's, I think, two. Um, there's, several, there's at least, there's at least four. There's at least four. There, well, uh, and, and he's probably, one. he's probably referring to the one that I presented to the Scottish government uh, to Mike Russell, and was uh, basically ignored after that. But uh, yeah, but there, there, are, there are more, there's more than one. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I, so, but th there you go. So that there's four versions of what what p different people think is important in the constitution. And without a doubt, a constitution is needed because I think the first thing we need to have established is what what powers and rights do we want Scottish citizens and the nation to actually have? And I think that's important that, that people have put thought into that. So I've not read all the different constitutions. I didn't know there was four. I did skim through, if you remember, Robert and Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, one that their their overview. Uh, Gr Gr Grouse, Peter, Grouse Peter did one, and Elliot yeah. Bulmer has produced at least I've one. I've heard so. of that one. I don't think yeah. I've read that one. Yeah. But um, I think I think uh, it's my view on many things, and it's why I like being part of the group. I would like us to look at all these options and steal the best practice from each one. Exactly. That's, one that's what I thought all along. Come up with a, a constitution that covered everybody's wants and didn't leave anything out and that you don't really get that if one group does it because of course it depends how wide their inputs were so i think perhaps bringing them together and basically setting up a, a group um for people to look through these different options 
Um, I think that is the first step. I think that could happen by next spring. Uh, I think if that was, and, and at the same at that conference, we could uh, all agree on, with the parties uh, also taking part, we could, we could agree on the way forward. Mm -hmm. And I think many things will happen. I've seen people ask, what do you think Alba can actually do? Well, I think it's already done things. It's already focused people's minds. Um, and uh, I always believe that if there's competition in a marketplace, that's a good thing. It improves and sharpens people's minds. So um, I think perhaps we'll see movement from the SNP in the right direction. I think maybe they'll start thinking outside the box rather than the old ways from seven years ago. You see, when Alex Salmon came up with the idea of, uh, I think it was it 2011, they put it into their manifesto. It was before my time, I wasn't interested in either the SNP or the independence movement in 2011. I wasn't, I wasn't paying any attention to it. It all changed in 2014, uh, for me anyway. And, but I, I think uh, what he proposed then was right for that time. But we're not in that time anymore. No, Look no. what's happened since 2014. I mean, who would have believed we'd have Boris Johnson elected as the leader of the Conservative and he'd be prime minister? I mean, you just beggars belief. He might and be and just the insane people. I mean, you know, Dominique Robb, Mike, uh, uh, Matt Hancock. I mean, these people are absolutely insane and they're the ministers running the country. It just it, it's just insane. I mean, you know, I mean, listen. Yeah, it's very scary. Uh, in in um, it's very scary that, uh, and it only becomes apparent. I suppose you look at it with Trump as well, where when things are running like normal and and there's no major disasters, then people get away with this sort of stuff. You know, they, they, they're never not they can't they don't really cause that much damage. But when you have a serious situation, it requires serious minds that pay attention to the Absolutely. detail and act. And, uh, and that's why uh, we're in now a very dangerous position. Scotland's, I mean, Scotland's uh, trading future with one of its largest markets, which was the EU, I think 46% of our exports were going into the EU from Scotland. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a large amount of our exports, you know? That has plummeted. Uh, but this was totally predictable. It was predict. I, I mean, <laughs> I sat in a, a room full of farmers um, up in Aberdeen, and I, I think it was about 2016, uh, and uh, it, yes, it was, and I sat and listened to, and in fact, they had a, a, a vice president of the National Union of Farmers on that panel, and he ran a dairy uh, farm, and he was against the EU. He was against the EU because he didn't believe, and I remember this because I put my hand up and questioned him on it. Uh, and they all thought I was some idiot from the city, which I was from the city, so I'm glad they thought that. Um, and uh, I asked him a question after he talked about, he thought, this 20% subsidy to farmers and we shouldn't have to run farms with a subsidy, etc. So I, I listened to that and I put my hand up. And in fact, I told them, I said, oh, I thought my food came from Asda. And they all, the room all burst out laughing because they thought, must have thought, Who, who's this idiot? Coming from the city, I thought, oh, my food came from Asda. Yeah, ha, ha. <laughs> I said, but, and they all thought, oh, what have we got here? And then I asked them the question. I said, so you're against the EU's uh, common agricultural policy with its 20% subsidies. I said, but those subsidies were brought in to make sure that we didn't go from one cash crop to another cash crop. Because if you, do, if you don't have the subsidy, you don't pay farmers to produce meat and eggs and, and all the other stuff, you know, and uh, milk, etc. Uh, and they go for cash crops, then you end up with shortages. I says, and that was brought in after the Second World War to ensure we didn't have food shortages. And he had to sort of then accept, oh, yeah, you're right. I went, yes. Yeah. So it actually, it, although it's a clumsy way of doing it and it's not always worked very well, it does mean farmers don't go out of business and it does mean we don't have shortages. So from those two objectives, it works. And that's just a simple thing. So people were against the EU because they thought, oh, well, we don't need it. Well, he might not have needed it for his dairy farm, but there'll be other farmers that will be producing other foodstuffs that will now be struggling. And I also said, and if we're getting out of the EU, then we're going to be cut off from that export market. And then what will happen is they'll open up the UK to cheap imports from elsewhere. I mean, if you, if you know anything about food production, 
on the mass scale, and you look at how it's done in the United States and in places like Australia, they has they have these enormous farms, enormous. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, do you know what I watched the other day? There's a German um, documentary uh, from Deutsche Welle, and it was going on. They they think that there's a link between um, Parkinson's disease and uh, pesticides, and it's been discovered in Germany um, that. A whole area of farmers are going are being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, um, and the only thing that seems to link them all together is the use of these certain pesticides. This mm. is why the EU is important because those pesticides are now banned. Yeah, yeah. And and so I just uh, I, it just annoys me when I hear people bashing the EU about the terrible things it does. Really. Actually, it does a hell of a lot of good, and we should have we should have realized that. But we were never told half of what it does. No, I mean, and, and, and and it's like the well, it is very much like the constitutional plumbing of of the of the single market. You know, I mean, the whole the whole idea that you can go into a, a local st store and buy stuff from all over Europe, uh, the, the, or, and that and that there's free trade, that there's no you know that, that there was. Uh, you know, people on a on a on a on a on a lorry could just get on at Dover, go over to Calais, no problems, no paperwork, just seamless. <laughs> and now it's uh, and now that's just been ripped apart. And no, but nobody. See, and, yeah, I knew and, that because I used to do the Geneva Motor Show for about eight or nine years, um, and uh, the so I know that Geneva, Geneva, in case people don't know, it's in Switzerland. So when you're leaving Dover uh, and you're going to take a van or a truck full of stuff merchandise over there you've got to have had an agent in dover so you have to pay them you have to produce all this paperwork you wouldn't believe people don't believe it even down to i had, a, I had to take a carpet right <laughs> for this exhibition so for the for the stand because the carpet that they want to give you it's the same carpet it's the same rubbish that they use for these exhibitions right and they throw them all away because they don't they only get used once uh anyway if i wanted it done in switzerland it was 25 euros a square meter so, all right. Uh, and I can't remember how many square meters was quite a lot. Um, so it was going to cost quite a lot of money. Um, but they'll they'll do it in Switzerland. Or I could have bought it from a small um, uh, carpet supplier in Edinburgh for two pounds seventy five a square meter. It only meant it meant I had to take it with me in a large van. So, of course, a massive difference in price. But before I could take it out, I had to find out the code numbers for the chemicals that it's made out of because it was polyester stuff. So you have to list all this stuff out, and you have to you have to tell them how heavy it is and uh, how many square meters it's got, and country of origin, where was it made? Well, it was probably made in China, like everything else. Um, anyway, so I had to fill out all this. That was just for the carpet. I had to do it for every single product, everything for the T-shirts, for every product, for the picture frames. Uh, there's wood in it. So what's the wood? Oh, I have to look up the code for this type of wood. And I mean, stuff. oh, it is that. All that, send it, email it down to the agent in London, well, in Dover, so that when I got to Dover, I go in there, I pay them the fees, they um, check it all off, uh, rubber stamp it. Then you go into the customs area. This is before you get on the ferry. Uh, into the customs area, you, you put your documents in, you have to wait. Sometimes it can take hours half a day, it depends how busy they are. This was two in the morning, so I didn't know how long. Anyway, it only took them about half an hour, and then they call you and say, oh, that's it, your papers are there, boom, stamp. You're now allowed to drive and get on the ferry. So we drove, drove the big van onto the ferry and drove all the way through France, get all the way to Switzerland, and then you've got to have your agent in Switzerland ready, and then you do go through all that process again before you can get into Switzerland. Then you go to the exhibition, and then you start building your stand. I knew from that ex those experiences that is what Brexit was going to be like for everybody. Yeah. And I know the problem of trying to get back out of Switzerland when you've got hundreds of trucks and vans trying to leave those at that exhibition. And, and, and it took me uh, nearly a whole day just to get my paperwork and pay the fees, the 2% tax that I had to pay. A whole day I was stuck there waiting no idea how long it's going to take it's gone they the, the agent sends it to the customs department in the swiss government tax office and you just have to stand around waiting and wondering how long is this going to take before i can leave the country because you're not allowed to leave they won't let you through the border 
uh, and eventually it comes and you pay the fee and like 400 quids worth or something um did you, did you actually make, you're like, you leave. did you actually make money off your ventures uh, on that one no no <laughs> basically it just about cost co covered its running costs but i mean you, yeah. if you're there for two or three weeks you've got accommodation you've got all the fuel i had rented the van for a whole month so there was the rental of the van and insurance and all this because you have to have insurance to go over europe now it's even worse yeah. i mean that now it's now now you've got to go through all that just to go to france <laughs> not switzerland um so i knew brexit was going to be a disaster and anybody with half a brain would have known that i wouldn't have predicted the shortage of truck drivers because i didn't know how many eu truck drivers there were i knew there was quite a few because you see you see the european uh number plates on the trucks at dover a lot coming backwards and forwards so i knew that but um I mean, the, we've got the perfect storm. We're cut out of our the single market. Our, our economy is being damaged. And frankly, I think the SNP missed a massive trick. They should have moved last year before we were dragged out. But let's not forget this. This isn't the SNP's fault. This is the unionists' fault. This is the cost of being in a union that basically does what England wants and ignores what we want. So there's a simple solution. Let's take our future in our own hands and do it so it benefits us. Like all the other countries. Was it 60 odd countries? I mean, you probably know better than I do, Mark, how many have actually left British rule. And the many, many. It's more than that. I, 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 I wrote it down in one of the articles I did, but it's uh, many, at least 60. And uh, none of them want to come back. None of them are banging on. No, the I'm oh, sure. Oh, please, Westminster, we missed you. We missed your co brutal colonial rule so much. Please, can we come back? And you know, we'll be your subservient. Uh, you How know, could uh, any of them survive? How could they survive? What currency would they use? Oh, they won't be able to. They figure it out, man. They figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it's the same. It's the same nonsense. Um, and uh, the people in Scotland uh, are smart enough uh, to know that it's nonsense. So. Um, it's about giving people, I think, a proper framework. Um, it's clear that what we've sent out it is having an effect. And um, I've heard that there's politicians having discussions. So although they haven't answered immediately, I, I think politics, in, uh, even in Scotland, I think it's Re about regarding our letters specifically. Yes, yeah. So it, it's getting attention. Good. Uh, good. I've, I've sort of been hinted at that's getting attention, but I think. Um, to move something like a subject like this, it's a bit like having a super tanker. It takes a hell of a long time to change. Exactly, direction. and it's the question but, of navigation. It's, yeah. it's, it's not you're, gonna, you're not going to fit through any little things that you know, uh, small inlets. You got to just go in the right direction and navigate it so that you know within the days or weeks or months that you get to the destination. But it's not just uh, you know just press but, a button and get there uh, yes, automatically. But we don't want it to be quick and overnight because we want it to be. To, we want it to be right exactly you know exactly we've yeah. got to, uh, i mean the only thing i agree with nicholas sturgeon on recently is we do have time now because we don't have an emergency election although i think we've only got about two years to the next general election um i mean it's frankly ridiculous to have a general election basically every two years which is what's been happening mm -hmm. you know i mean uh, it's extremely as anyone who knows who goes out and campaigns it's extremely tiring for the campaigners and for the activists that deliver the campaigns. Um, and we've had one, well, we had the referendum, then we had uh, the general election 2015, then we had uh, the EU election 2016, we had uh, another general election 2017, another one in 2019, and uh, we had the council election as well. I think that was 2017. Um, and now we've got another council election uh, next year, and we've just had an election for the Scottish Parliament. I mean, it's it is exhausting. Um, just and, very quickly, uh, uh, John Nicholson. Since 1939, 62 countries have got independence from Westminster, and not one not one wants to get back in. So I'm I'm extremely thank, thank shocked. You John. Thank you, John. <laughs> I'm extremely shocked that none of them want to come back to have their economies ruined. Um, by the British. Uh, I mean, I and, do remember and their reading. MPs la and their MPs laughed at and belittled, even, and then their language suppressed and their culture suppressed, and their you know, I mean, you know, you know, you know the score. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so I, I think, uh, I mean, somebody did ask me over at the hope over over fear. So I think my uh, the message I'd like to get out 
every single Yes supporter needs to put their country first before their party. And that goes for everybody because um, we need to be focused on what's best for the country and best for the Scottish nation and best for all our futures. We can argue about which party we want to vote for later on, um, and I'm sure we will. But uh, at the moment, this is the biggest danger to us. Our, our way of life is being ruined. You know, I mean, I, I just, apart from there's job shortages, so there's shortage of people for the jobs because they've left. Well, isn't that what um, the people in England voted for? They wanted rid of all the foreigners. Ironically, yes. basically, basically, the Brexiteers said, we we freaking hate you foreigners, bugger off. Uh, they did. And now they're oh, like, oh, wait, please, you come back. Please, back. You want your back. please come back. And they say, just, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you just have to say, I'm sorry. I mean, maybe it's because I've traveled so much and driven. I mean, I even drove to Germany in a day from London to get a document signed. It was absolute madness. And I, I, it wasn't until I came, I got back, and I got back to London, all within one day, right? Hired yeah. a little car, got the insurance sorted out, had to get a stupid sticker for the back for the GB thing, only to find out the car was all plastic and glass at the back, so it wouldn't stick to anything because it's magnetic. <laughs> <laughs> I went out to go like that, and it fell off. And I thought, what? And then I knocked on it. It's all plastic. Plastic piece of shit. Yeah, it was. It was, it was a piece of shit. Um, uh, this tiny little car, and I, what do you know what made me laugh at customs at, at Dover when I came back because they must have thought that's suspicious. That number plate only went out about 12 hours ago, yeah, because I drove basically got on the ferry, got to Dunkirk, drove from Dunkirk, so that's France, into Belgium, Belgium into the Netherlands, Netherlands to Germany. Uh, back round, it got, got it signed. I was only in Germany about an hour and a half at the most. Back, yeah, fill up the car with fuel, drive all the way back, back on the ferry. And uh, you know, and of course, there's no, there's no borders. You see the big EU border for the Netherlands. You're leaving the Netherlands. Oh, now you're in Germany. You know, now you're in the Belgium. You think, bloody hell! And there's no, there's no borders. You just no, keep driving. No, no, exactly. You know? The only thing you know when, in when Belgium. I, when, I, when I first came to France, I remember driving down to, um, uh, to Spain, and they had the the buildings of what was the border check places there. Now, I mean, you're driving through Toulouse and it says, oh, Barcelona in, I don't know how many kilometers, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, and, you know, you can't imagine that, you know, like driving down the M5 or whatever and saying, uh, you know, uh, Barcelona or, you know, Paris in this many kilometers or whatever. It's just, uh, yeah. It, well, it's we, we, yes, we won't. I mean, uh, I, I think we should, uh, uh, I mean, I sometimes think we should just build a big brick wall, you know, we'll do, we'll do a Trump. Well, build the wall. Um, I mean, that's nonsense as well, isn't it? But what, what, what that reminded me of, though, when I got back, uh, and so, oh, yeah, custom. So they pulled, pulled my little car in for a check, right? Asking me where I'd been. What was the purpose of my trip? I thought you shouldn't even be asking me that. It's meant to be free movement. Um, being a typical Scot Scotsman. <laughs> England's border patrol. I said, oh, God, this is the only place that asks me what I was doing. Did I have anybody uh, hidden in the car? And I just laughed and went, well, you <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you could find someone, in there, hide someone uh, in this uh, Citroen C1 tiny little car, or it was a Peugeot, I think, 107 or something, anyway, whatever it is, tiny little thing, you know, that there's no room in it. I went, well, what do you think? I've got a person hiding in the boot. There is no boot, you know? <laughs> so I had to explain I'd gone over to get legal documents signed, and I'd uh, we we couldn't risk these original documents going missing if the courier had lost them. It would have caused us a lot of problems because there was people in different countries had to sign them. So this was the quicker way of doing it and cost me less than using the international courier. So um, that's why I'd done it. So I had to show them the contract that had been signed and countersigned and witnessed and all that. Oh, right. So uh, they must have thought I was a drug dealer or something, you know, <laughs> in a tiny little hire car. Yeah, um, instead of a, a hundred thousand pound Mercedes or something like that. But anyway. Yeah, I thought, yeah, see, see that black BMW that now that looks suspicious with the black windows. <laughs> Let's stop them. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's it made me laugh. However, it, it what it reminded me and what highlighted is there's no borders between Belgium. I mean, I was going to say the only time you know you're in Belgium is on their motorway, they all drive like maniacs. Yeah, and, and, and the quality of the roads is terrible. It, it's, it, Their you know, roads are bad, yes. Theirs are worse, whereas the Netherlands roads were immaculate. I mean, yeah. immaculate. 
same in France. Their roads, in my mind, you have to. No, pay. they're they're, they're oh. excellent. You you pay oh. you pay a lot in you pay a lot in gas prices, but it's very well kept. And oh and no, the, I know. I'm mean, unlike the ones in and the you, UK. And you take the major the highways and the payage. You know, the toll is quite expensive. For example, going from here to Bordeaux, you pay at least twenty five euros. Uh, you know, just just to drive on the highway. But that but they yeah. are impeccable, absolutely impeccable. No, I know that. I mean, there's there's not a pothole anywhere. Yeah, I know they look like they're brand new, but then there you go. So I think Scotland should have roads like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, we just need to be planning our future. Our direct links to the EU are essential. Trade to the EU is essential. Uh, and of course, there'll be trade with England. Of course, there will. I mean, it's an interesting and it's an, a little known fact, but um, Scotland generates all its own energy and exports electricity to England. So when they all go on about, oh, and, and what if we don't buy it? Well, don't. Don't buy it. In we'll fact, I'd like, to know what, I'd like to know what currency they're going to use to pay their electricity bills. Because <laughs> they seem to forget that it's the seller that decides what currency they, they accept, not yeah. the buyer. Yeah. yeah. You know, oh, I'll give you these bits of monopoly money. No, thanks. Um, we won't sell it to you. And, and, they, and they rely on a connection with France. And I notice France is threatening to cut them off. Over yeah, over, over fishing licenses in Jersey, exactly. Yes. exactly. So isn't it, I mean, who, but you see, it's just the British mindset of they used to run an empire. So they think, they think the world owes them a living and that no, yeah, oh, every, everybody has to conform and everybody has to conform to their standards, you know, and, and, uh, and you know, or, or else they, or else they're screwed because they're Great Britain or they're England and everybody else are these little, you know, tiny colonies that can't survive, but for the grace of the queen and, or whatever. Anyway, okay. Well, anyway, I um, always used to think in London, I always used to think it was like living in a theme park when you were in London city center, you know, in, in the center of London, there's all these, there's Nelson's Column and there's Hyde Park Corner and all this. I just think you, it's like living in the past, you know, and Buckingham. Very, very quickly, uh, D David yeah. is brilliant. Great show th tonight, Mark. Thanks. And yeah, I know I know he's brilliant. That's why I asked him to join the well, SSRG. But yeah. uh, I'll, I'll send the check to her later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm, well, listen, we, we've touched on, on things. I think uh, my m message that I'd like to get out to people is, Get back in touch with your yes group. Get them together. Uh, by all means, contact um, us through our website, and we'll, we'll try and get one of our people to come along and do a presentation and answer questions. Um, but we've got to start pulling together uh, because it's up to us to deliver independence. It's up to us to create what country we want. Uh, it's too important to be left to politicians. Uh, and the politicians will help, and they will help deliver what we tell them we want. It's really that simple. It's called okay. democracy, funny enough. I know. I and, and if we can actually create, uh, re, you know, really create that in Scotland where it's never truly been before. I mean, you know, it's been more democratic since uh, Holyrood was, uh, was, was created, but it's still, it, it's only very limited powers over certain areas. Uh, and, and it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a Scotland that has not ever been a true democracy. And if we can, you know, go forward and what we're doing and with, with other people's help and create a, a really true democracy that I think uh, that that's kind of what I've been devoting my life to for at least the last decade. So <laughs> anyway, you know what? I'm looking, I'm looking forward to the weekends after we've got independence and we don't have to have SSRG meetings anymore. That yeah, would be great. We, we could just have annual, annual reunions and stuff like that. Yeah, so. yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a yearly party and say, God, God, remember when we got those politicians? Yeah, we're, we're, we're in our wheelchairs and stuff. Oh, remember back when we were got Scotland into you know, Do you know what? That we need to launch a competition for people to try and guess who who the pictures are. These were this right in that. Okay. The, those images are actually real people. So go on and look at our logo and try and work out who those people are. <laughs> it's true. They're actually real. I pictures. believe it. I, I just don't think I, I, I know I wouldn't have any success at doing that. But uh, anyway, any, uh, we need to say goodbye. But anything you'd like to say before we wrap it up with our viewers? Yeah, visit our website. Uh, the link, I think, is on screen. It's been on screen a couple of times. There you go. Yeah, it popped up Scott again. Researchgroup.org. Uh, register. Download that uh, uh plan and route that we've sent to the politicians and then contact your politicians and tell them you want this support 
Yeah. Um, uh, just just to resume very, very, very briefly, the letter that we sent that is on the Scottish Sovereignty w website uh, specifies that, look, we've looked into this and mm -hmm. this is a plausible uh, Pacific legal route to independence mm -hmm. that if the if the Westminster MPs dissolve uh, vote collectively, that 30 out of the 59 vote collectively to uh, to dissolve the Treaty of Union. There's nothing in the unwritten UK Constitution that can prevent that. And and, and likewise, with the Scottish Parliament uh, declare, you know, uh, uh, passing a resolution saying that they are the supreme you know, representatives of, of Scottish sovereignty. And then there's no a parliament above that. Uh, it can be achieved legally. And we already have been in contact with countries who are willing to recognize Scotland. And many, many others are will be very sympathetic if it's clearly explained, if they say, OK, look, we're in this situation with this Brexit and this fucking bastard England piece of shit, you know. <laughs> He, and, and oh yeah, oh we know about that. Yes, at least sixty-three countries. Like, oh yeah, we know all about that. You know, kind of thing. And you know, gets uh, there's no question, it, but it has to be. There's always been it, for me. There's always been this kind of reticence. Oh, we don't want to piss off England. We don't want to do anything. They're our colonial masters. If, if they get pissed off at us, you know. But that you know the colonial mindset. That's you know, prevented. Well, you asked if the last thing. So here's the last thing. Go ahead. Uh, the union uh, benefited Scotland for a period of time. You know, when we were building ships and there was the coal mines and you're going back 100 years, Scotland was uh, uh, producing a lot and a lot of our people left the country to better themselves. That that should have been a warning, of course. Um, so I, th I think uh, the problem is the union. And so I think many people in Scotland were quite happy to go along with the status quo. Because well, we were okay. We were doing all right. We, it wasn't bad enough. Including my, including my dad and my granddad, definitely. You know. Well, they, they... And, and so I, I, yes, I absolutely think that's that's what the mindset was. That has all changed. It's not an understatement to say Brexit has effectively destroyed the union. There's no benefit for Scotland being in it at all. There's nothing but pain and damage and economic damage. Um, and that experiment that they're running down in London. It's destroying jobs in England. It's destroying supply lines. Uh, we, we're only just starting to see the beginning of it. It's going to get much, much worse. You know, I mean, if you think um, there's shelves, empty shelves already, and I've seen it locally. I noticed it back in the spring. In the spring, I noticed things disappearing off my Asda shelf. And I thought, is it just me that has noticed for three weeks that product line hasn't been there? And uh, it's steadily got worse. Mm -hmm. And when you hear that there are shipping containers being held up for weeks, um, I've noticed fresh produce, uh, uh, which has a very short shelf life. That's because it's sitting, waiting to get through customs. So half of its shelf life is wasted. Um, so it's only going to get worse. Mind you, it, 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 it is, it's important to add, um, add, add that it's not uniquely UK phenomenon. I mean, there apparently in in, uh, in Long Beach, California, there's like 50 ships, 50 container yeah, ships waiting to get in there. So it's not that, but there's no question that um, that, uh, you know, Brexit has made it worse, especially with all of the, especially with the anti-immigrant immigrant sentiment, which is pushed, pushed away uh, many of the uh, Eastern European uh, truck drivers. Uh, it's a big combination of factors, but there's no question that, that it, Brexit has made it worse. I live in France, no problem. Yet, yes, the, the price of fuel has gone up significantly. There's no question, but no problem with stuff with with uh you know the, the the shelves are completely full in the grocery store we just don't have those problems you know here so Listen, um, scotland do you know uh the most recent um uh, news of these gas shortages and, and the worry about that and the price rises the dramatic price rises which of course are still to be fed through to consumers mm -hmm. um uh, is that f finding news that in italy They've got 11 weeks of supply in storage. We've got less than seven days as a country. Yeah. Because we sold everything off and dismantled it and never invested in the future. Scotland needs to invest in its future. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, on that on that note, I'll leave it. But thank you, everybody. And I we didn't get to get, get uh, we didn't get to all of the nice comments that you sent us, but we very deeply appreciate it. And uh, we shall um, I'll see you all next week. And thank you, David, for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. Sure.